Welcome back, everyone, and thank you for staying to the bitter end. Um, I'm sorry, we did try and get everyone in a little bit early, but uh, apparently that's not the way to do it. So um, welcome back anyway, and we'll try and get through this session in good time. Um, Professor Massard has agreed to come back and talk for a fourth time in two years, uh, for which we're very grateful, and we look forward to hearing his surgery talk on surgery for complex thoracic infections. Thank you very much again, dear colleagues. Uh, the topic is a little bit difficult to treat because it's a kind of hodgepodge and so uh, the way to get out was to consider that uh, maybe the disease is complex but uh, we will look from the other side and uh, look on the treatment which may be complex and uh, otherwise said uh, the uh, uh, complex uh, procedures we can imagine would be uh, in this particular situation on the one side the good old uh, throcoplasty and on the other hand uh, the uh, pneumonectomy for destroyed lung. Uh, the major part of this talk will address uh, the uh, throcoplasty issue. So uh, if we go back uh, to the broad space and to uh, chronic empyema this time uh, there again, uh, we have uh, two uh, different types. The first one is uh, associated with a uh, more or less uh, uh, usual uh, pneumonia, and the second one are the categories of uh, secondary empyema I alluded to in my previous talk. The mainstays of treatment are, of course, exactly the same. We need to clean and evacuate the broad space and we need to re-expand the lung if there is some lung left or fill the broad space by uh, some other procedure. So cleaning the broad uh, space uh, may result in an extreme operation which is the open window thoracostomy and uh, filling the broad space when there is no lung left or few lung left it may require either filling up with muscles or momentum or bring the chest wall down to the lung uh, or to the mediastinum uh, with a thoracoplasty. Uh, there are some uh, important questions we should ask before we uh, bring the patient to the operating room. The first question, of course, is uh, which quantity of lung is left? Has there been no surgery? Is there partial resection or pneumonectomy in the history of the patient? Second point is, is this only empyema or is there an associated fistula? And the fistula may originate uh, most often from uh, the bronchial tree, but it may also be an esophageal fistula or, more exceptionally, um, kind of uh, abdominal organ fistulizing into the broad space. And uh, the next question is if there is any uh, specific infection underlying and the two which are the most interesting for the thoracic surgeon are uh, tuberculosis and aspergillus infection. And then uh, in these patients, uh, another question which has its importance is uh, to ask how are the uh, perithoracic muscles because uh, some patients will already have undergone a thoracotomy with transection of the muscles and most of them with chronic infection will have a debilitated nutritional status. Uh, before I go into the substance, I wished to show some uh, historic views uh, we will probably never see again, and so maybe uh, it will be of interest for the young, younger among us. Uh, this brings us back uh, to dark ages uh, prior to 1960, which marked the advent of uh, rifamycin uh, for treatment of uh, tuberculosis and in these former years uh, one of uh, the ways to treat tuberculosis was to bring uh, the lung down and in some way to asphyxiate uh, the mycobacterium. The easiest way to do this was to create an intrapural pneumothorax which of course required reinjection every two weeks because air is uh, resorbed. When adhesions uh, developed uh, our predecessors were quite uh, agile to do this, uh, with, uh, to bring the adhesions down with uh, thoracoscopy. Mm -hmm. When this was not possible, um, 
there was the, the option to create an extra pearl pneumothorax. And when this failed, uh, it came up to the extramuscular plombage procedures. And last but not least, uh, thoracoplasty. And uh, what is interesting for us today is that all these procedures, except thoracoplasty, uh, could lead to some uh, chronic infection later on. Here, for instance, is uh, the situation of an uh, acute infection in the space in the residual space after intraproral uh, pneumothorax, which happens something like 40 years after, where decortication is an option, and you see that these are not uh, VATS decortications. This requires an approach, strong fingers, to bring out the calcified peel. Uh, the extra uh, pearl pneumothorax uh, could be recognized because it is a little bit suspended in the apical area. This is not uh, in the free pleural space, but in the extra pleural space where the pleura is stripped off uh, the upper ribs. Then uh, extra muscular plombage, this uh, was a patient with a false aneurysm around uh, these uh, ping pong balls. And uh, this is another patient with a bilateral uh, muscle plombage. The principle here was to do exactly the same dissection as for thoracoplasty. That means uh, to strip off the uh, intercoastal muscles together with the periosteum to leave the ribs in place and then to bring uh, these uh, ping pong balls uh, inside. And uh, one of the first uh, signs of infection is the migration of these balls. In a lucky patient, they migrate just under the skin, uh, as you can see here. Uh, but uh, in uh, less lucky patients, they can make, migrate to the mediastinum and create some erosion, be it of the trachea, be it of the esophagus, or there is uh, one nice uh, case report where the ball migrated into the aorta and uh, created an uh, acute ischemia of both uh, lower limbs. So let us go back uh, to the present and uh, ask ourselves how we could uh, perform a proper thoracoplasty. Well, uh, this is an extreme example of a complete uh, hemithoracectomy, and you see this uh, has been made a while ago <coughs> because there is some kind of calcification because you leave the periosteum in place so you have a um, regeneration of uh, bony tissues. Uh, this is another extreme example in a patient with bilateral apical aspergillus uh, fungus balls and who could not tolerate the resection. Indications for thoracoplasty, uh, well, uh, there's this historical classification between the uh, parenchymal uh, indications and the plural in indications. Uh, excavated uh, tuberculosis is no longer an issue in our countries, but uh, aspergilloma is uh, still up to date, and some of these patients will be unfit uh, for lung resection, and thoracoplasty will still be helpful. Uh, the uh, second uh, group of indications is uh, the apical pleural space after lobectomy, and uh, this is quite a problem in uh, patients who undergo lobectomy for tuberculosis, and we are still um, exposed to such patients, especially with the increasing uh, migrations. And the last uh, problem where uh, thoracoplasty may eventually be helpful is when we are dealing with empyema after a pneumonectomy. So uh, the general principle is to remove as many ribs as is required to bring the chest wall down to what is left. That may be uh, the remaining lung, but after pneumonectomy, it may be just the mediastinum. This, for instance, would be for an apical space. This would be uh, for pneumonectomy. And as you see, uh, the further we get down, the more we leave uh, uh, the larger the part of the remaining rib uh, will be. Um, to plan the, thor the thoracoplasty is quite easy. You just take a plain anterior posterior chest film, you look at it, and then you can count the posterior segments of the rib and see how many is required. Uh, patient positioning, like for postrolateral uh, thoracotomy, may be tilted a little bit more to the ventral side so that uh, the incision uh, may go up uh, to the angle of the scapula. 
uh, it is uh, recommended to leave a small amount of the trapezius and the rhomboideus just uh, to keep uh, the shoulder motion. And then uh, the important principle is to do a subperiosteal resection of the rib so that the periosteum remains in place and, and after a while will regenerate some bony tissue which will give the uh, necessary rigidity to the chest wall. So it's perhaps better to do this with a rasp than with a cautery because uh, cautery will burn everything and uh, the regeneration is uh, compromised. Uh, so, uh, once you have freed uh, the rib of uh, the periosteum, the uh, important uh, part is to remove the posterior uh, aspect of the rib, uh, which means to go into the uh, transverse joint and the costal vertebral joint with a special, uh, specially designed trasper. And the reason is the following, if you leave the neck of the rib, you will uh, leave a residual uh, pleural space here. And uh, if you remove it, well, you have stripped off the pleura from uh, this uh, kind of sinus here and bring it back to the level of uh, the uh, vertebral column. When you do a sarcoplasty, you should always uh, start from below upwards. Uh, so uh, if it is, for instance, a five rib sarcoplasty, we would remove the uh, posterior arch of the fifth rib and then elevate the scapula with a chest retractor, which we put with, its, with one blade onto uh, the sixth rib and with the other blade onto the scapula, and then we bring it just up, and this nicely lifts up uh, the scapula. Uh, to go onto the first two ribs, it needs some special rib scissors uh, to be sure to have uh, the entire length of the rib. If you leave a small amount of uh, the second rib, it will just point under the skin and it may even erode. Uh, the first rib, uh, well, that is an endless discussion among specialists for sarcoplasty, but uh, my masters told me that we have to remove it, so I am a classic, uh, classically educated uh, sarcoplastic surgeon. Uh, when it goes down uh, to the sixth rib or lower, there's another uh, thread. Uh, it's uh, the uh, scapula which may slide inside the chest wall, and that's a very um, dreadful situation because it is painful and it uh, blocks, it freezes uh, the shoulder. So if you go down uh, to the sixth rib, it is recommended to uh, cut a piece of the scapula below the spinal part of the scapula. Uh, the ninth rib is better to leave it always because if you cut the right ninth rib, you disturb the uh, lower costal uh, chondral arch. And then uh, at the end of the procedure, it is recommended to drain both the pleural space and the uh, peri uh, perithoracic space. Uh, well, I don't like to go into this uh, tedious discussion. If you wish, we can do this later. And uh, some words about the post-operative care. The first few days may be difficult, especially the patient with a recent pneumonectomy, because you will have some unstable mediastinum, and you should take uh, care for that by a dressing uh, where you should reinforce this upper part of the chest with a sandbag or maybe just uh, these kind of uh, plastic uh, containers with uh, saline. Uh, when you remove the chest tubes, the best uh, thing to do is to leave the holes open as, op as opposed to uh, the usual uh, chest tube removal. And an uh, important part in the recovery of the patient is played by physiotherapy. And uh, there are two aspects beside re-educating the remaining lung. Uh, that is to avoid scoliosis, and the best you can do is just to put a mirror at uh, the foot end of the bed so that the patient can see himself and has the feedback about his position. The same way that a good golf uh, coach would take a film of you so that you uh, understand your motion. Uh, and then the second point for the physiotherapist is to uh, care for the shoulder. Uh, the alternative to thoracoplasty is a myoplasty. You see that there are 
uh, many large muscles which uh, can be used, the omentum can be used, but uh, we should also keep in mind that for an apical uh, prolt space, it may be easier to remove uh, three or four ribs than to do several other incisions to bring muscles up, which will also contribute to some uh, freezing of the shoulder. So now, uh, which are the uh, typical situations where uh, thoracoplasty may be required? The first uh, issue I wish to discuss with you is uh, empyema after partial lung resection. So what happens when we are doing a lobectomy that is uh, quite easy? Uh, we have a shrinking of the pro space anyway because uh, the diaphragm will shift upwards, the mediastinum will shift to the operate, operated size, and the ribs will, uh, the intercoastal spaces will uh, close. And then we expect some over distension of the remaining lobe to fill uh, what is left. Uh, so, if we have a residual space, there are some uh, factors which will definitely come from the lung. Uh, and the uh, important issues here is uh, when the lung is too stiff uh, to expand, that's, that can be uh, because of some uh, fibrotic changes, but also because there is a visceral peel. And uh, the second reason might be that we have removed too much, for instance, a left, uh, right uh, lower and middle lobectomy or an upper lobectomy plus uh, the apical segment of the lower lobe. Of course, uh, care when we have some uh, granulatus uh, disease. Or if the patient has already undergone an operation and shows up with a stiff mediastinum or diaphragm. So this is a little bit uh, of uh, science, but going back to very old years, you see that uh, such work has already been published in almost one century ago, uh, when it was to find out whether uh, an approach space was closed or uh, communicated uh, with a peripheral uh, bronchiolar fistula. So uh, pressure studies as done in the 30s show that uh, the pressure is uh, stable during breathing in a closed drill space and restores the baseline when there is a communication with a bronchial tree. And you can uh, conclude the same if you look at an, uh, gas analysis inside, uh, especially uh, in a closed uh, space, uh, you have um, more carbon dioxide and less oxygen than in an open one. But what is interesting for us uh, for decision making is the following classification, which is quite easy. Um, we distinguish between a benign space and a malignant space. So the benign space is just the radiologic finding with absolutely no complaints in our patient. And the malignant space, of course, has some uh, signs of infection and uh, looks uh, much more ugly on uh, the x-ray. Uh, this, for instance, is an, uh, a complicated uh, space, a malignant space. Uh, it's a patient who underwent a left upper lobectomy for uh, multi-resistant tuberculosis and showed up with an apical space, which we finally brought down with sarcoplasty. Here you have a uh, CT scan view of uh, the thoracoplasty where you see ribs on one side and no ribs left on the other side. Second problem, late empyema after pneumonectomy. Uh, here are some uh, figures uh, which you know quite well. And uh, when does this happen? There is an increased risk if we are talking about pneumonectomy for benign, benign diseases such as destroyed lung, uh, in presence of aspergillosis, maybe uh, some uh, foreign body left at the initial operation. Uh, I'm a little bit more um, uh, septic, if I can say like this, uh, in, in uh, talk about sepsis, uh, about this uh, concept of hematogenous uh, colonization. I think that. Uh, the bacteria we find have been brought in at the time of operation and for some mysterious reason uh, wake up only a couple of months or years later. Basis of treatment, of course, uh, is to clean. 
uh, tube tarcostomy and lavage is seldom successful because you have so many uh, fibrin deposits locations inside. So uh, the uh, modified Clackett procedure is certainly the best to do. Uh, that means a detersion with a sarcostomy and a an, uh, vacuum uh, device. And then in a second step to obliterate well, uh, one way to do is a simple closure, as recommended by Claggett uh, half a century ago, uh, or then to fill with myoplasty or mantoplasty, but this needs a large volume of muscles, which is not always available, or to go uh, for the pharcoplasty. Here you have the view of the uh, open window pharcostomy with uh, the vacuum addressing. And then uh, when we have this complicated uh, outcome after pneumonectomy, we should always uh, hunt the fistula, and there are several ways to f uh, fistulization. The easiest to deal with is the fistulization under the skin, uh, and then the more tedious ones are the bronchial fistula, or uh, very rarely, but we should always look for it, uh, the esophageal fistula. And just a word about the uh, esophageal fistula, uh, which is not very uh, frequently described. Uh, this reveals in the patient, of course, with some uh, septic uh, problems. Uh, and uh, one of uh, the uh, interesting uh, symptoms is uh, pain while swallowing or some foulish uh, taste in the mouth. And uh, then uh, we should be careful when we find some uh, candida albicans in the pleural fluid. This usually comes from the esophagus. The key of diagnosis is contrast esophagram. Uh, we have to rule out local recurrence because maybe in contemporary uh, oncologic surgery, the most frequent cause for this uh, esophagopleural fistula is local recurrence. And if there is no local recurrence, then of course we can go for repair, which will probably require muscle flap uh, suturing and thoracoplasty. Uh, this, the third uh, point where uh, sarcoplasty will still be very helpful is uh, pleural aspergillosis, uh, where we have an um, interesting pathophysiology because we have those cases which reveal uh, early after the operation while the patient is still in hospital. This is usually due to interoperative seeding and failure of re-expansion of the lung. And then we have the more late cases uh, where usually there is a bronchopleural fistula uh, which uh, gives access to residual, residual pleural space and uh, leads in this way to the colonization. And of course, uh, whatever the situation, this is a special variant of empyema and the general rule is the same. If we want to cure the patient, we have to care for an obliteration of the pleural space. Uh, what can we do? Uh, well, decortication is not always efficient in these situations because of the loss of volume. Myoplasty is debatable. I see uh, in particular the problem of nutrition and uh, previous thoracotomy so that there's not enough substance to fill adequately. Uh, open window thoracostomy is, uh, of course, uh, pure palliation or transitory uh, procedure. So what is left is uh, thoracoplasty. Here is uh, an overview of what we have published several years ago, uh, what you can achieve with thoracoplasty. Well, of course, uh, these are uh, complicated cases. Uh, the outcome is not very smooth, but at the very end, uh, we had a negativation of uh, the zero diagnosis in uh, 12 out of uh, 14 patients. Uh, this is a uh, case uh, report of a lady who got a uh, right upper lobectomy for T3 lung cancer with uh, post-optive radiation therapy. And uh, several uh, years afterwards, she developed a kind of uh, necrosis of the lung uh, in the context of a semi-invasive aspergillosis um, with uh, this kind of filling of uh, the uh, pleural space and uh, there, of course, there was no way to expect to bring up an uh, irradiated lung uh, up to the apex uh, to do a completion pneumonectomy. It makes no sense because this was in the pleura 
and not in the lung. So we brought uh, the chest wall down to the remaining lung, and the lady did fine. So uh, some words now about the, the destroyed lung. Uh, first of all, uh, why uh, do we see destroyed lungs? That is mainly due to tuberculosis. Uh, the two first theories are coming from uh, South Africa, where there are, of course, many, many cases of uh, tuberculosis left. The, sec uh, the third series here is uh, from Turkey, and uh, there is less uh, tuberculosis because uh, Turkey has perhaps more problems uh, with uh, bronchiectasis. And uh, in case of unilateral bronchiectasis, it may require uh, a pneumonectomy to cure the patient. And we have a very small and uh, not very encouraging experience I show you. Uh, an interesting phenomenon is that most of the destroyed lungs, and especially uh, those related to TB, uh, are happening on the left side. You see a uh, different uh, series uh, taken from the literature which obviate uh, this phenomenon. And this has been uh, described in thorax by a colleague from uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, Mahmoud Ashour, uh, who described two entities. The first one is what he calls the left bronchus syndrome. He explains this. Uh, preferential occurrence on the left side by the fact that uh, the longer and narrower uh, left main bronchus is uh, compressed by the uh, hilar nodes under the aortic arch where there is really no way to escape. And uh, this is associated uh, by the same author sometimes to the acquired patent ductus syndrome uh, when there is a huge hypertrophy of the bronchial uh, vessels uh, which re-inject into uh, the uh, pulmonary uh, circulation the same way as would do in the patent uh, ductus. The operative risk, as uh, we said before, uh, is uh, not that much mortality because uh, these are young patients predominantly without uh, comorbidity uh, without uh, chronic respiratory failure. Uh, the only uh, disadvantage is that chronic infection leads to a very poor nutritional status. And that is perhaps also why uh, they have less uh, effective uh, defenses against infection and that uh, empyema is by far the most uh, frequent uh, complication, be it empyema alone or empyema combined with a bronchial fistula. Not everybody does as uh, well as we did, with almost half of the patients coming out with an infected pleural space, but uh, I will show you why. Uh, so the uh, operative risk factors for these destroyed lungs, once again, are a presence of or history of tuberculosis. If there is an empyema associated to the uh, uh, destroyed lung, it is quite obvious that when we do the pneumonectomy through an empyema, we take a major risk. And in these patients, it brings me back to the case report we saw at the end of uh, the preceding uh, session. In these cases, we uh, put in two chest tubes the same way as did uh, Mr. Walker, but uh, we wash immediately after the operation. We don't wait for the infection to come. We do 10 uh, days uh, with uh, uh, permanent irrigation and Hopefully, this uh, prevents. Uh, if we are going for aspergilloma, of course, in a destroyed lung, this is a dangerous situation. And uh, it is uh, in the fashion to say that a right-sided pneumonectomy is more dangerous than the left one. I can show you my figures. I have killed as much on the left side than on the right. Uh, now, uh, to go back to our uh, not very satisfactory experience, uh, when we compare those patients we operated with Aspergillus and others, you see that uh, among those with Aspergillus, virtually all uh, came out with an empyema, whereas we get a much more reasonable uh, frequency of uh, empyema in the non-aspergillus patients. So uh, we have to conclude because time is running. Uh, what I wish to say is that, of course, uh, we 
are in an area where we have to follow guidelines, where we have to do evidence-based medicine and so on. But if we are going into these more uh, complex situations, we are far away from uh, guidelines which will help us. And then perhaps it is becoming less a science than a matter of cooking, which means we need experience and we need some feeling. I show you just uh, our family picture and I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor Massa. Can I just ask, with the modified Claggett procedure, you now use a, a, a vac dressing inside the cavity to start off with after the initial procedure. Um, how long do you leave the vac dressing in for b before going on to either a thoracoplasty or a myoplasty? Oh, uh, well, uh, once uh, the chest is open, once you have uh, the vac device in, uh, you have uh, saved the patient's life, there is no more infection, so there's absolutely no hurry. And what we actually uh, try to do is to wait and to see how far we can obliterate the space with the back. Because sometimes it's very surprising, you, if you're a patient, uh, within a couple of weeks or months, you have an almost uh, complete uh, obliteration of the space. Uh, the thoracoplasty was our initial reflex when we were just putting meshes inside and then of course with the meshes uh, uh, after a couple of weeks the patient is complaining because uh, there's this uh, foulish smell around it and uh, uh, the oozing from the dressing and so on whereas with the vac it is uh, closed uh, you have the possibility to have the patient in ambulatory fashion coming just for the dressings and it is uh, quite better accepted. Any questions from the floor? I'd just like to thank Professor Massad for coming again to the oh. Society of Cardiothoracic Surgeons. Thank you so much. I'm most grateful. I thank, thank you, you very for much. your kind invitation. <laughs>